In the last video, I shared with you Houston Smith's introduction to a Buddhist Bible edited by Dwight Goddard, and in this one I want to share the editor's preface, in other words, Goddard's comments relative to this uh, 1970 edition. Uh, and of course he makes reference to the fact that uh, the first edition came out apparently in 1932. I will mention that my own copy of this, which I got back in 79, what I did, I pasted on the front cover this particular piece of calligraphy, which I believe means emptiness. And on the back I pasted a picture of Bodhidharma, the perhaps mythical figure that brought Buddhism from India to China. And I'm learning more and more over time about how much uh, China influenced Buddhism and uh, just the tremendous uh, impact it had on their culture over the many hundreds of years during which it was uh, introduced, during which the sutras were translated and studied and pondered over. Now again, with respect to, to Goddard's uh, work, uh, Buddhist Bible, it does have, in my opinion, as I recall it, the uh, bias, if you want to call it that, of, uh, of, of orienting itself in a very spiritual way toward the reader. In other words, these translations are not super tight or literal. Um, the, the translations that he sought out apparently were ones that helped, res help, helped devotees, helped believers, helped Buddhists, pra Buddhist practitioners resonate and, and feel in the depths of their hearts uh, the, the profundity and the meaning of the, of the scriptures. But anyhow, let's hear what, uh, what Goddard himself says about this particular volume that he edited called A Buddhist Bible. The first edition of this Buddhist Bible was published in 1932. When the need of a new edition became evident, it was decided to enlarge it so as to include other scriptures of like importance so as to make it more comprehensive. This involved making a number of new translations, for which we are indebted to Bhikshu Wai Tao. We are also indebted and are very grateful to a number of other Buddhist scholars for permission to use their translations, as noted in the appendix. The compiling of a Buddhist Bible is a very different matter from compiling the Christian Bible. In the first place, there is no hierarchy or ecclesiastical council to pass upon the authenticity of different scriptures and as to their canonicity. In the second place, Christian scriptures are a closed system of doctrines and dogmas that have been inspired by the Holy Spirit and are to be accepted in faith. Buddhism, on the contrary, is looked upon as a growing organism whose scriptures are of many kinds as the organism has developed under different racial, temporal, and cultural conditions. As disciples follow the Buddha's noble path and practice dhyana, concentration, and intuitive meditation, they have an unfolding experience of spiritual insight and grace, which any one of them may describe and elucidate. Some of these experiences are of highest value, some of less value. Some are concerned with the Dharma, some have to do with the rules of the brotherhoods. Some are philosophical, some psychological. Some are commentaries, and some are commentaries on commentaries. In the third place, there is the difference of quantity. In the Christian Bible, there are 66 titles. Buddhist scriptures number over 10,000, only a fraction of which have been thus far translated. In the Song Dynasty, about 972 AD, a Chinese version of these scriptures was published, consisting of 1,521 works in more than 5,000 volumes, covering 130,000 pages. The nearest approach to canonicity is the Pali Tripitaka. That was the earliest collection and was supposed to be limited to the words of Buddha. Southern Buddhists are passionately devoted to these Pali scriptures and are inclined to disparage and dispute the more philosophical scriptures of the Northern School that developed later after Buddhism had come in contact with other world religions in Persia, Palestine, Egypt, and Greece. Under these conditions there developed in Northern India and Kashgar a succession of very able minds, Ashvagosha, Nagarjuna, Vasubandhu, 
and his brother Asanga, from whose writings and teachings there develop various important schools of philosophical thought that profoundly changed the understanding of Buddha's Dharma. Later on, as Buddhism spread into China and came under the influence of its immemorial culture and practical good sense, it took on forms of Taoist naturalism and kindly humanism, and there developed forms of, quote, salvation by faith in Amitabha's mercy and rebirth in his pure land. While in Tibet, coming in contact with its ancient Bon religion, and under the climatic conditions of its high altitudes, it took on forms of strenuousness and magic and tantric conceptions. Later on, in Japan, owing to political and social conditions incident to the presence of a limited but powerful noble class dominating a suppressed peasantry, which had developed extremes of loyalty and obedience and self-control, it took on forms of concentrative meditation known as Zen, and a still more widely divergent type of the true Pure Land sect. Naturally, among these diverse conditions, Buddhist scriptures vary widely, and the quantity of them being so enormous, they have become segregated into different groups as they are favored by different schools of thought and practice. The Tian Tai favor the more philosophical scriptures, the Shingon the more esoteric, the Chan or Zen the more intellectual, and the Pure Land the more emotional. The present editor has been guided in his selection of scriptures for this Buddhist Bible by a sincere purpose to make the selection as comprehensive as possible within its limits and to present as truly as possible the original teachings of the Blessed One, both as understood by the Southern and more primitive school and by the Northern and more philosophical interpreters. He has also humbly tried to have the choice vouched for by his own spiritual experience in his practice of the Noble Path, and especially during its eighth stage of intuitive dhyana. It follows, therefore, that the scriptures thus selected are the generally accepted scriptures of the dhyana sects, Chan in China, Zen in Japan, and Kargyupta in Tibet. Of course, among so enormous a collection of scriptures, there are others that are favorites also, notably the Siddharma Pundarika, or Lotus of the Perfect Law, and the Avatamsaka, said to be the grandest religious document ever written. But these are very large books in themselves. The late W. E. Soothill of London left a very careful translation of the Lotus that still waits a publisher. Dr. Suzuki of Kyoto has made a translation of the Gandavyuha sections of the Avatamsaka that is now in process of being published. The inclusion of Lao Tzu's Tao Te King is open to question, as it is not strictly a Buddhist text, but its teaching has such a close affinity to Buddhist teaching, and nearly all Chinese masters of Buddhism were Taoist scholars who, upon becoming Buddhists, did not give up their Taoist conceptions and terms, and because the Lao Tuan teaching in the Tao Te King has had such a wholesome influence on the development of Chinese Buddhism, and in later years, wherever the Tao Te King is held in reverence, it has tended to restrain individual pride of egoism, religious ceremonial, ecclesiasticism, priestcraft, and insincerity generally, we make no apology for including it. In fact, it is our earnest wish that the Tao Te King may become one of the foundation stones of American and European Buddhism. Just a closing word as to the rules that have guided the editor in his choice and handling of textual material. He has always kept in mind the spiritual needs of his readers. This Buddhist Bible is not intended to be a source book for critical literary and historical study. It is only intended to be a source of spiritual inspiration designed to awaken faith and to develop faith into aspiration and full realization. The original texts, having for centuries been carried in memory and transcribed by hand by scribes who were often more loyal to their master than to historical exactness, are often overloaded with interpolations and extensions, and in places are confused and obscure. To carry out the design of the editor, he has omitted a great deal of matter not bearing directly upon the theme of the particular scripture, and has interpreted occasionally where it seemed necessary and advisable, in order to provide an easier and more inspiring reading. 
The need for this course will become apparent to every earnest-minded disciple. In these days, when Western civilization and culture is buffeted as never before by foreboding waves of materialism and selfish aggrandizement, both individual and national, Buddhism seems to hold out teachings of highest promise. For two thousand years, Dhyana Buddhism has powerfully conditioned the cultural, ethical, and spiritual life of the great Oriental nations. Its rationality, its discipline, its emphasis on simplicity and sincerity, its thoughtfulness, its cheerful industry, not for profit but for service, its love for all animate life, its restraint of desire in all its subtle forms, its actual foretastes of enlightenment and blissful peace, its patient acceptance of karma and rebirth, all mark it out as being competent to meet the problems of this excitement-loving, materialistic, acquisitive, and thoughtless age. Its basic principle of an eternal process based on unchanging law and operating in eternal recurrence, leading to mind control, to highest cognition, to purest conceptions of love and compassion, to ever-clearing insight, to highest perfect wisdom, to the self-giving of bodhisattvas and Buddhas, to blissful peace, is worthy of confidence, and its noble path worthy of trial. The theme of this Buddhist Bible is designed to show the unreality of all conceptions of a personal ego. Its purpose is to awaken faith in Buddhahood as being one's true self-nature, to kindle aspiration to realize one's true Buddha nature, to energize effort to follow the noble path, to become Buddha. The true response to the appeal of this Buddhist Bible is not in outward activities, but in self-yielding, becoming a clear channel for Buddhahood's indrawing compassion that all sentient beings may become emancipated, enlightened, and brought to Buddhahood. <laughs>